So we'll start with a few questions just to know exactly how far or how fast I, I should go. Um, uh, if you're like more technical than non-technical, raise your hand. Okay. And uh, if you use some kind of Gen AI product every day of the week, raise your hand. Okay. And then the small vanity metric one, uh, have you ever heard of dust? If you've ever heard of dust, raise your hand. All right, this is great. Um, so we're, we're Dust, we're a small team, uh, just under 14 people. We're based in Paris, which I used to describe as the city that has the Eiffel Tower, and now I'll just say it's the place where Mistral is headquartered. <laughs> and, um, and for the last year and a half, my, uh, my co-founder and I have known each other for 20 years, uh, but for the, uh, the last year and a half, we've been trying to think about what was going to happen when the, the power, the potential, um, and the amazing capabilities of these models became uh, better understood. And one of the aspects of the problem that felt particularly interesting to us after uh, times in our careers at OpenAI, but also at Stripe and uh, Allen, a company that is a written first, fully async culture, was the ability to really try and bring the context of the company and put it at the fingertips of each and everybody in a team. And it seemed that there was going to be a need for a pretty strong application layer to help people explore, deploy, iterate on the types of assistance, I'm not gonna use the word agent yet, uh, that might be useful in their, in their workflows. And so the promise of Dust, which is built on its own orchestration platform that I'm not gonna spend too much time on, we'll have a quick peek at it in one of the demos, is to try and really crack team productivity with AI assistants that are easy to deploy and have the context on your team. I'm gonna try and give a broad demo of some of the capabilities and focus on what we think is important here. So first of all, most of the assistants are by default in a conversational format. I think it's not ideal, but I also think it's a great REPL interface for people who aren't necessarily experts on this technology to get a lot of quick feedback on whether they're going in the right direction or not. And the ability to test the different models that everybody's talking about seems something that was quite interesting to us. So at Dust, you can quickly get access to all the leading frontier models and put them in touch with the internal data at your company. Um, I've completely cheated and uh, saved some of these prompts. Based conversation structure is a thread. We really think that we're preparing for a future where, you know, in a team of 300 people, um, it might be that, um, there we go, it didn't actually recognize some of the agents. Uh, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, um, I should not have uh, said that. So we, we think that the thread structure is gonna be really important because humans and non-humans are gonna be collaborating quite quickly. So bringing various members of the teams, but also various uh, assistants in the conversation is gonna be valuable. So I'm gonna actually ask uh, Claude to summarize that. And we think that as more and more employees of the teams get comfortable with bringing assistance into their workflows, there's gonna be a higher and higher bar to meet on the ability for the assistants to take a large portion of the workflow into their own hands. So one of the workflows that I end up using quite often is our weekly shifts. The team loves it because it gives me an idea of what people have been up to for the last seven days without really spending too much time on the details. And the format of the output is what I wanted to just highlight here. You know, trying to save those 10, 15 seconds to get the things pasted into the right page of the meeting is how I think deployment is actually going to happen for teams. To get adoption and practical use cases used by tens or hundreds of people within your team, you want them to hit that productivity value that's very close to your day-to-day -day workflow or what you're habitually doing. So in this case, the output format is a table, the, actually, the chunks that were actually um, recovered are available, and we provide the citations when required. What we think we're seeing more and more is the value of the context the companies are bringing in. So with Dust, it's quite important to be able to quickly bring in the types of apps that people have and use every day. The retrieval isn't trivial to get right. I mean, who's actually built retrieval structure for a documentation? All right, and keep your hand up if that documentation is changing all the time. All right, and keep your hand up if you think that stale versus non-stale is a, is a non-trivial -trivial problem to fix. All right, okay, so when you start working closely with the ability to retrieve the data, a lot of things and funny things happen. So what we've built is connections that we think are high fidelity on the types of content that people end up sharing in these types of applications. 
And again, these applications themselves are building the capabilities to expose their own data through um, an embedding-like interface. But it's the ability to bring them in contact with each other that we think is going to be valuable for the teams. So uh, whether it's connections that we offer, data that you can output and post by API, or websites that you want to add. I actually tried to add um, the data-driven website. There's a lot of Lorem Ipsum on the data-driven New York uh, New NYC website, so I don't know that the demo would be particularly interesting there. But once that data is in the context of the company, we think it has to be super easy, super easy to evaluate, and super easy to iterate on to build these assistants. I'll just quickly show you a demo of an assistant that I've called Bree Wood. My friend Bree uh, is an amazing product marketer. She worked at a couple of companies. She had a, her, own, um, her, her own website. And she built this, uh, pod, um, this content website called the Kool-Aid Factory with amazing tips on how companies should run their business. I always love to go back to it. I always forget to go back to it. And I think I should use it about 10 times more than I do. So I've decided to use Bree Wood in everyday conversations and try and bring Bree into the Slack threads that we have day in, day out about, you know, how should we actually structure the team as it grows or think about the best ways to communicate and collaborate. And the way we've decided to build this on Dust is with pretty simple assistant, very basic instructions. You could pick the settings. She's been performing pretty well on GPT-4. She actually would have done a great job on Claude Free too. The temperature settings that we've also made available are not something that we've described as temperature, because the vast majority of our users have never heard about the word temperature. They probably don't want to hear about the word temperature. They want to see what it does to actually have two breeze, one very factual and one very creative, responding to each other, to get a sense and an intuition for how these assistants might be useful to us. The data sources and actions is where we've exposed a certain number of primitives that are pretty sensible. We have semantic search, the ability to exhaustively aggregate content from a certain data source or a SQL interpreter, which is going to be able to run a SQL query on the basis of, um, of the natural language prompt. And in this particular case, I've just pointed semantic search at the website that I've aggregated, which was a couple of clicks to just get running. And that website crawler is going to be updated on a regular basis. Uh, and my friend Brie is a disco ball because that's what I think she should look like. And she's available in the chat or on Slack. Uh, how should we collaborate as we grow? The ability for anybody on any team to build these assistants has been the unlock for us to actually get adoption at some of our largest customers. And our large customers are still fairly small. None of them are larger than 2,000 employees right now. Um, but it's been fascinating to see which people come back with the most powerful ideas. I think we're in a phase where technical ability is not the best predictor of the actual ability to adopt, promote, and have your team really increase their output through generative AI. There's a mindset thing going on. It's something between the ability to explore, the will to iterate, the desire to actually just go and try new things that's been fascinating, whether it's on legal teams, on HR teams, on product or engineering teams, where we've seen hundreds of scenarios that we could not have come up with, but that have definitely been a great source of inspiration for our templates. I'll show a quick demo of the SQL interpreter capability. We have a uh, very true and not fake at all spreadsheet of data with people's genders, start dates, salaries, and equity. People don't see these as data tables, and most people in the company should never think of them as data tables. But they have an employee ID, which is the same across tabs and can be used as a key to actually get quantitative data. Quantitative data is a very bad thing to try and query with semantic search. So having the assistant be able to interpret the need to switch to SQL interpretation is quite powerful. What we have here is, um, I'll just, another assistant that's focused on trying to understand if you're asking a question about employee data and shares, to try and use the employee ID as a key and join across the various tabs to give you a quantitative answer to the question that's being asked. So um, is there a senior employee with fewer than uh, 20K shares? Something that most HR teams are kind of panicked about on a regular basis, trying to make sure that we have the right. So, the interpretation is going to translate the natural language query into a SQL query, execute that against an image of the Google spreadsheet that we keep updated, and then return 
the result. Like you, like you can see, there's an explanation of the query, the actual query. We have a result, and we're outputting the results. So co uh, zero zero one is the endpoint in question, and indeed they're the one that is. Uh, there we go, senior, but with fewer in the chest. Um, with the time I have left, I just wanted to mention the actual orchestration platform that all of Dust is built on. The GitHub repo is available. You can just go and check it out, dust-tt. Um, but all of the capabilities of Dust are pr uh, provided by its own orchestration platform, which means that we can actually build assistants that call complex, complex orchestrated apps. So this is an example of an app that is going to generate an SDR outbound email for a startup if it has recent fundraising news by incorporating that recent fundraising news into the outbound email. And it has a couple of blocks that use LLMs to try and discriminate if the news is on fundraising or not, and then to generate the email. But it's going to be wrapped in an assistant. Nobody on the team is going to know that the app is running in the background. They just call an assistant from Slack or anywhere where our API is available. That's it. Thank you very much. Question from me. What was the hardest technical challenge so far in the history of the company? The one we're trying to crack right now, which I didn't demo, is multi-action, so more agentic capabilities. I think there's a huge nut to crack on the expectation of asynchronous interaction and the complexity of the task that's at hand. Now, how many maximum runs should you infer from the type of query in order for the outcome not to be disappointing? Because at the end of the day, it can be the smartest result, but if it's spinning for a number of seconds that most users had not at all anticipated, they're going to say it's broken or they're going to say it's not working. The second one I'd cite, which, has, which was a surprise to us, is just the number of things that can go wrong in a classic, like mid-sized company rag assistant scenario. Is it like the prompt is not optimal, the model is not an optimal setting, the data wasn't even set up, the admin didn't give access to the right data, the rag isn't working because the retrieval strategy is not optimal, I've been using an old embedding model and that's not great, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you, when you're analyzing evaluation, I think that the evaluation by most teams is kind of something to throw out the window. What we've done that's been successful is to give teams very granular, i.e. emoji level uh, encodings for feedback so that they can, within their own teams, give feedback on, I think the data is not being pulled in correctly, or I think it's actually Dust's fault. Uh, and that saved us a ton of time versus debugging cases where we didn't have the data to begin with.